A blessed day to everyone. Welcome to the Covenant Word of God, the preaching telecast of Bread from Heaven Christian Fellowship's Media Outreach Program. We are a Reformed and Bible-based Christian church located at Concha Cruz, Domingo Poblete Street, BF Homes, Paranaque, Philippines. To know more about our church, please visit our website, www.breadfromheaven.org or follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to message us in any of our social media accounts if you need prayers or counseling. Now, let us share with you the solid biblical truths that will help us rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ, rejoice in His presence, and revere our God. Today, I will be delivering my sermon on the life story of Samson. But we all know the story of Samson how he tore up the lion, how he has very long hair. His long hair is the source of his strength, and how he had a tryst or a relationship with a girl named Delilah, and uh, we knew uh, how it all ended. No? Samson is not really a very good example to use in terms of the topic of covenant headship. He was a sinful person, vengeful, reckless, and he dishonored God in the story. As a result, he got into a lot of difficult situations in his life. So many of us will say that Samson was a failure as a leader in many aspects. He's not a good example to be used for positive lessons on how to be a godly covenant head. However, in discussing Samson today, our sermon will focus on God's grace and God's mercy and how God continued to work through Samson despite his sinfulness and his failures in covenant headship. Now, many of us covenant fathers may be struggling in our own personal lives that is preventing us from leading as covenant heads in our families. Some of us may be struggling with sin or we are living in a sinful life such that we dare not take the mantle of leadership in our covenant families. Some of us may have failures in the past, and this is affecting our ability to be the head of our covenant families. Some of us may currently be going difficult and challenging situations, maybe because of some wrong choices that we have made in the past, and we are suffering from the consequences of those. And somehow this is inhibiting us or preventing us from exercising covenant headship in our families. Our sermon today taken from Samson's life, serve as an encouragement for many of us and to remind us that God is a gracious and merciful God and that He is able to work through our failures, our sinfulness, and our difficulties in life so that as covenant heads in our household, we may be restored to spiritual health and become useful to God for the work He has assigned for us to do. Our topic for today, even when covenant headship fails, God is still sovereignly at work in our lives to fulfill His divine will for us. In what ways does God work to fulfill His divine will for us even when we fail in our role as covenant heads? We will see how God works to fulfill His divine will in the life of Samson in at least three ways, and we may learn valuable lessons through Samson's life as we apply it in our lives. First is this, God works through our messed up situation to achieve His purposes. Judges chapter 14 to chapter 15 verse 13, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timna. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. And at that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came towards him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he, although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he has done. Then he went down and talked with the women, and she was right in Samson eyes. So after some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion, and honey. He scraped it out into his hands 
and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there as for the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they bought 30 companions to be with him. And as Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you, if you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And then he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father nor my mother and I shall tell you. And she wept before him seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to him, to them, if you have not plowed with my high fur, you would not have found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 men of the town, took their spoil, gave the garments to those who told the riddle. And in hot anger, he went back to his father's house. Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been the best man. Chapter 15. And after some days at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And the father said, I really thought that you have utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regards to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards. Then the Philistine says, Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you. And after that, I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Etam. Then the Philistines came up and then encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the son of Judah, the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come to mind Samson, to do to him as he had did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are ruler over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, We have come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me, you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. It starts with Samson wanting to marry a Philistine woman who lives in a place called Timna. Timna is a neighboring town nearby the border between Philistine territory and where Samson lived between Zora and Eshtaol in Dan. Now, this was not something to intermarry, to wanting to marry a Philistine woman. It's not to be taken lightly. Why is it so? Because this is sinful in the sight of God. How so? Well, for one, in wanting to intermarry, he defiled God's calling for him to be consecrated to him. Remember, he has the Nazarite vow, a lifetime Nazarite, dedicated to God throughout his lifetime as decreed by God himself. And in wanting to intermarry a foreign woman from an idolatrous nation, the Philistine, which are their sworn enemies, by the way, Samson showed that he is selfish and that he was sinful because he did not honor God's call for him to be separately 
holy for him. A Nazarite, separated, consecrated to God. Now he wants to mix it up. He wants to marry a Philistine woman from an idolatrous nation, which is their enemy. Also, we see that in wanting to intermarry, Samson, he despised God's purpose for him to be Israel's deliverer, Israel's judge, the one who will deliver them from the Philistines who have been oppressing them for the past 40 years. In wanting to marry this Philistine woman, he was abandoning his call to be Israel's deliverer. He would create a scenario where he would be seen as collaborating with the enemy. Kinasal mo kalaban natin eh. Also, he disobeyed God's explicit command for them not to intermarry. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 to 4, before they enter Canaan, the promised land, while they were sojourning, malapit na po, pumasok ang Israel sa promised land. No? God says, you shall not intermarry with them. Give your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. God explicitly commanded them not to intermarry. For in God will drive them out one day. So he disobeyed God's explicit command in wanting to marry one of the Philistine women. And also, Samson dishonored God by not having the desire to raise up a godly family. His union with the Philistine woman meant that they would raise up children, family, that would be influenced by their pagan mother, and this would lead them to idol worship. Samson was selfish. He only thought of himself. He dishonored God. He rejected God's command, and he belittled his calling and his purpose. Samson's selfish and sinful desire led to a very, very messy situation. We have just read. No? It escalated. No? During the seven-day wedding feast, ang ginugla ni Samson, he put out a riddle. Okay? Nagpayabang siya. No? He says, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. And Samson was pertaining to the lion that he killed with his bare hands earlier along their way to Timna. And so the carcass no, soon developed beasts. No? So beasts came and uh, created their hive. And so there was, behold, there were honey. You know? The 30 Philistine men you know, who were assigned to the wedding feast, which is part of Samson's guest list, you know, so he wagered you know, against these 30 men and says, if you can solve this riddle, I'm going to give each of you a set of clothes. But if you cannot solve this, you give me a pair of clothes. So simple seems to be harmless in waging. You know? We see that Samson was very arrogant. You know? He was sure that nobody would be able to solve his riddle. Kala po natin, 30 sets of clothes is no small thing. No? Mahal po ang mga damit during that time. No? They don't have these factories that creates the, the machine that creates uh, the clothing. No? Uh, during that time, everything has to be handmade. 30 sets of clothes is no something to be sneered at. It's very expensive. Samson was very arrogant. No? So he wagered something that is very big. No? Taas ng kanyang bet. No? Now, the 30 men who were desperate to lose in the wager threatened to burn the wife and the father-in-law of Samson. Kala nyo, the, the wager was just something simple. No? Taya-taya lang. Diba? Sometimes, nagtataya tayo. Mananalong UP sa Ateneo. So, nagtataya tayo, di ba? Oh, 500 pesos. So, you see, you know, kala natin the wager was only something that is uh, innocent, no? something that is small. But it escalated now. The man says, matatalo kami. Therefore, we went to the wife no, and says, if you don't ask Samson to give us the answer, we will burn you and your father. See how wicked they are. Samson's wife was uh, scared. And so, he pleaded with Samson, please, honey, tell me what's the secret of your riddle? Sabi ni Samson, di ko nga sinabi sa parents ko, ikaw pa. Pero nakuha sa kulit, sinabi ni Samson. Then when Samson, the, when the wife told the men uh, the secret of the riddle, and so Samson lost the wager. Natalo. Epikon din pala tong si Samson. Samson got angry. He has to honor his word. He escalated the problem, the situation some more. So he went to a place called Ashkelon. In Ashkelon, which is one of the five key cities in the Philistia, in the territory of the Philistines, it's something like 55 kilometers kilometers away. Samson has to walk that long to Ashkelon in order to kill 30 people, take away their clothes, and use these clothes to pay the wager. Isipin nyo, bakit siya pupunta doon? Layo-layo. And then, he has to take 
to kill 30 men, get their clothes, and pay his lost wager. And unbeknown, so Samson, after paying the wager, he went home. And unbeknown to him, his father-in-law gave his wife to his best men. Kasi natakot, violent pala itong magiging son-in-law ko. So he gave the wife, the daughter, to his best men. And when Samson went back to take his wife, his father-in-law says, Sorry, you take my other daughter na lang. Isn't he more beautiful than the, the one you married? And Samson, of course, does not want second choice. Gusto niya yung somebody, the person that he liked. Samson was angry uh, because of what the father-in-law did. And so he further escalated the situation. He took revenge. He caught 300 foxes. Know how hard it is to catch a fox? Tied them up by pairs, put a torch, lighted the torch, and released this 150 pairs of foxes into the Philistine fields. At that time, sabe, it was the wheat harvest. So this is around March, April time when the people there were harvesting wheat. And this wheat is very, very important to them. Itong wheat na to will be food for them for the entire year. And then what Samson did was he released the foxes with the fire on their tails and burned down the wheat fields. Yung mga naani na, saka yung mga nandun pa sa field. And then even the olive orchard were burned. Now the olive orchards, no, they harvest all somewhere six months down the road, August or September time frame, and these olives will give them the oil that they need that would last them for the entire year. What happens is all the food was burned and the oil that they expect six months down the road was nowhere. And the orchard trees burn. It takes five to eight years for them to grow again. See the disastrous consequences of that burning of the field? No wonder the Philistines got very angry. And when they found out this issue, okay, and the cause for this was because the father-in-law of Samson refused or gave his daughter to the wife to another person, they burned the wife and they burned the father-in-law. Really, no, they're such a cruel people. And Samson, upon learning that his wife was burned, he further escalated the situation. He took revenge by killing many, many Philistines. And then he ran into the cleft of the rock in Etam, somewhere in the territory of Judah. So the Philistines escalated the already messy situation. This time, they went to raid Judah. Okay, sabi nila, ilabas nyo na si Samson. So the men of Judah, fearing the Philistines, went to Samson as he was hiding in Etam and asked him and then captured him and uh, surrendered him to the Philistines. Imagine the pain of being sold out by your own fellow men. Instead of defending Samson, his own people, the people of Judah, not part of the, the tribes of Israel, surrendered their fellow men to the Philistines. Masakit po para kay Samson. See how messy the situation was. This messy situation happened of Samson's own making. It all started with his sinful desire to intermarry. And this escalated and escalated in violence upon violence. His sinfulness created this mess. He was to be blamed for this messy situation that he was in. Let's look at verses 14 to 17. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting. This was a time no, that they surrendered Samson, no, the, the people of Judah. The Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he put out his hand and took it, and it struck 1,000 men. And Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, and with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a 1,000 men. And as soon as he has finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramath Dihai. After the people of Judah surrendered Samson to the Philistines, the Spirit of the Lord empowered Samson. He broke loose from his bounds, and he used a fresh jawbone to kill 1,000 Philistine soldiers. Samson was delivered by God out of this colossal, messy situation that he was in. He was delivered by God. We also see that after the victorious rout of the Philistines, Samson became dehydrated and was about to die from it. And he was very thirsty. See, and he called upon the Lord and says, You have granted us this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of this uncircumcised? And God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi, and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. And therefore the name 
name of it was called En Hakore. It is at Lehi to this day. God provided water for Samson. Water from the rock from that uh, came out to meet his needs. God was so gracious to Samson in spite of the mess that he is in. In the end, this messed up situation that he found himself in resulted to Samson as being elevated and recognized as the judge of Israel. Because in verse 20, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistine for 20 years. The Israelites saw Samson's great strength and the way the Philistines were routed by him. They would rely on his strength to break free from Philistine rule. Thus, because of this incident, Samson was recognized as the judge of Israel. Despite the great colossal mess that Samson created and brought upon himself because of his sinfulness, God turned this around and used this messed up situation to achieve his good purpose and will. Uh, during the time that Samson asked his parents, I want to marry this girl from Timnah. In verse 4, it says, His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines ruled over Israel. So God used the sinful desire of Samson to achieve his purpose of appointing Samson to be Israel's judge and to deliver Israel out of Philistine oppression. God was gracious to Israel despite their idolatry and their sinfulness. God was gracious to Samson despite his sinful ways and despite his dishonoring God. God's grace is shown again and again in Samson's life, not because Samson deserved it. He's very sinful, reckless, so selfish. But God continued to be gracious because he is a covenant-keeping God. He promised to be Israel's God. And that despite their rebellion and their sinfulness. God is zealous for his covenant people. God's grace is just too much to comprehend. Are you in a messy situation in life right now? Something that is because of what you did in the past that created a messy situation? Be reminded of God's grace and mercy. He has the best plans for you and his sovereign plans for you will be fulfilled despite your sins and your failures. We just need to repent of our sins. Seek God's grace to help us get out of the messy situation that we are in. If the grace and mercy of God is shown to Samson in his mess up situation, in his sinfulness, the same grace and mercy of God is available to you and to me in whatever mess up situation we may find ourselves in right now. Pray, but do not abuse the grace of God. The second thing we see in the graciousness of God is that God works through our weaknesses to accomplish his plans. Judges chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute. He went in to her, and the Gazites told, were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. And they kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose took hold of the doors of the gates of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. Now, this is the second story in the life of Samson. And this story happened during the 20-year rule of Samson. So the first story that we read a while ago in our first point, that was the story of Samson before he became Israel's judge, because before he was recognized as Israel's judge. Now, in this story, Samson was already Israel's judge, recognized as Israel's judge. No? And there is this single story that was written by the inspired writer of the book of Judges. Just one single story for the entire 20-year rule of Samson as Israel's judge. Because the next verse, the third story that we will read later on, will be the most famous story of Samson and Delilah, which happened at the tail end of his 20-year rule as Israel's judge. Nothing was shown of Samson's achievement as Israel's judge in this entire 
20 years, how he overcome other challenges posed by their enemies, how he worked with his fellow men in this 20 years as Israel's just nothing, nothing, except this very saucy and savory uh, story or incident no, of Samson. We can safely assume that as Samson ruled as Israel's judge, he must have really done a good job at it because the rule of the Philistine over Israel was broken and nothing was mentioned that they ever got suppressed or ruled over again by the Philistines in this 20-year rule. There were no stories written regarding the Philistine coming back against uh, Israel. Instead, only this story. What is God saying to us? What lesson does God want us to learn from his choice of story to be revealed? Now, this story of Samson visiting a prostitute reveals to us that Samson succumbed to his weakness even at the time that he was ruling as Israel's judge. His weakness is his love for Philistine women. In the first story, he fell for a Philistine woman and he took him as his wife. And that did not end well. Now, he went to a veil of the services of a Philistine whore. So first, Philistine wife. Second, Philistine whore. So Samson went to Gaza. Gaza is very far from where Samson lived, around another 50 to 55 kilometers away. Now, to travel this distance meant that Samson was not just strolling around and happened to pass by Gaza. He was somehow determined to go to Gaza. So there was an intention to go to, into enemy territory. It was not just a sudden decision, or out of the moment, spur you know, thing. He was a very much wanted man by the Philistine that we know, and he still had the courage to enter into enemy territory. He's either proud or reckless. Even if you are strong, it is foolhardy to go into enemy land as this puts your life at risk. Also, it was not only Samson's life that was put at risk. The safety of Israel as a nation was also put at risk. If Samson were to be captured by the Philistine, if he was to die at the hands of the Philistine, Israel would not be safe anymore. There would be no more champion for Israel. So Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he availed of her services. Samson succumbed to his weakness for Philistine women. He defiled his sacred body. He defiled the essence of his Nazarite status to be consecrated to God and for God's use. And this sinful nature of Samson is very much alive and kicking in him despite him being the judge of Israel. You are now the leader, the judge of Israel. So we expect him to be living a life of as a good example for other people. But no, his sinful nature was very much alive even though he was their leader. And this just shows us that even Christians leaders or mature Christians may fall into sin and temptation as our old nature is very much alive and at work to bring us down spiritually. Let us be alert all the time that we may not succumb and fall into the sinfulness of our old nature. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober-minded, be on the alert, be watchful because your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. We have to be very much alert. In committing this sinful act of defiling the sake greatness of his body, Samson also put his own life at risk. When the Gassites learned that Samson was in their city, they laid an ambush for him. And as at night time arrived, a city would close its city gates for protection. And Gaza, being one of the five key cities no, of the Philistine territory, is one of the biggest. And the city was surrounded by walls to protect itself. And so the Gassites no, closed the city gate and set a trap for Samson. Samson was trapped. He was very much at risk. However, God again delivered Samson through his great strength. So Samson might have known that there was a trap. So he did not wait until morning to depart from the city. He left at midnight. How did he do it? He tore the city gates with his bare hands, bar and all. And the city gates are not light wood. They are very thick, very heavy wood, reinforced by iron to make it strong. The city gates were the weakest point in the entire city wall. And so they had to make it very, very strong. And they are really very, very heavy. And Samson just tore them off while they are still locked. He has such fantastic strength. Parang papel na pinunit lang. He just tore the city gate, bar and all. This just shows he is really, really very strong. This is the strength that marks his entire rule 
as judge over Israel in keeping the Philistines in check. Samson's stamina was also seen. He carried the city gates all the way to a place in front of Hebron. Some Bible scholar says he just carried the gates to a place in between Gaza and Hebron. And that is maybe just around a 45-minute walk. So imagine carrying those city gates at your back for 45 minutes. They're very heavy. It just shows Samson has such great stamina. This lone story in the entire 20-year rule of Samson as Israel's judge shows us one thing that God continues to use Samson to be Israel's deliverer despite his continued sinfulness. Maybe this is the general description of his entire 20-year rule as Israel's judge, captured in this one single story. And God intended for us to learn the lesson that God will continue to use his children to fulfill his plans that he laid out for each one, despite their weaknesses and their sinfulness. Friends, brothers and sisters, are there any sin that you are succumbing to every now and then? Your weakness, sins, habitual sins that somehow you cannot overcome and you feel discouraged, depressed, and you withdraw from God and from serving God. And so you do not read the Bible, you do not pray often because you feel ashamed and you feel that you're a hypocrite. May the story of Samson give us renewed hope. God use Samson despite his weaknesses and failures. God may continue to use you to achieve his perfect plans. Do not neglect reading the Bible. Do not stop praying, but all the more pray and read his word. Do not neglect fellowshipping, but come to church now that we have face-to-face -face meetings. Being here in church is a good sign. And for those who are watching online, this may be your way of escaping from fellowshipping with fellow believers because maybe you are ashamed of your sinfulness. But do not run away from God because you are encountering or struggling with sin. God still used Samson despite his sinfulness in his 20-year rule. God will continue to use you to achieve his plans in spite of whatever sinfulness that you're struggling in right now. So never run away from God. Never. Ask for prayers. Repent again, again and again and again. And seek for counsel from our church leadership, from our pastors. The church is here for you. Let's go to the last point of the sermon. The last lesson is this. God works through our hopeless condition to assert and display his powers. Judges 16 verses 4 to 31. This is the story of Samson and Delilah. After this, he loved Samson, loved a woman in the valley of Sorek. Now, this is just near where Samson lives, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistine came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will give each, each will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one would subdue you. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like other men. And then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she, was, she had men lying in ambush in the inner chamber, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings, the thread of flax snaps when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, be Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that had not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him and said, and to with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes of his arms like thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and become like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into a web. And she made them tight with a pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. And he, she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me this three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him 
very hard with her words day after day and urged him. His soul was vexed to death. And he told her with all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me. They shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he has told her with all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again. He has told me all his heart. Then the lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hands. Then she began to torment him, and his, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison, but their hair, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. The lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hands, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young men who held him by his hand, Let me fill the pillars, and on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Samson called to the Lord and says, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he has killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of Manoah his father. And he judged Israel for 20 years. This is the third and the last story written in the Bible in Samson's life. Samson, in this third story, saw another Philistine woman, Delilah. Samson fell in love with Delilah and made her his mistress. Samson fell again to his weakness for Philistine girls. First, he took a Philistine wife. Then he subscribed to the services of a Philistine whore. And now he fell in love with a Philistine woman lover. Samson never learns from his mistake. This weakness is repeatedly highlighted in the passage by the inspired writer to convey to us God's message that Samson, while he's strong, he has his weakness for Philistine girls. However, this time, the engagement with Delilah would spell the tragic end for Samson and the work that God has assigned for him as Israel's judge. While Samson loved Delilah, she did not reciprocate his love, but instead he betrayed Samson through the promise of lots of money to be given by the lords of the Philistines. There were five lords, five key cities, each promised to give him 1,100 silver times five. That's 5,500 pieces of silver. That is an obscene amount of money during those times. Just shows how desperate the Philistines were to capture Samson. Delilah, because he was, she was paid, she betrayed Samson. She knew Samson loved him, so she used that against Samson. And she tried to pry out from Samson the secret of his great strength on three occasions. And all three times, Samson lied to her about it. It is a wonder why Samson would not have seen through the intent of Delilah's evil intention to disarm him of his strength so he could be subdued and captured. Or maybe Samson knew about Delilah's intention, but he was too arrogant and he would think that he would not be captured because of his great strength. Samson was either foolish or quote-unquote stupid, sorry for the term, at the same time. Sometimes you see when you are in love, we sometimes become blind. Ano sabi? 
love is blind. Sa mga kalalakihan no, na fall in love, no, uh, sometimes we become blind to the realities no, that are before us because we are blinded by love. Samson is just so blind because she loved Delilah so much. Three times, Samson did not show, tell Delilah the secret of his great strength. Then, Delilah employed a most powerful weapon <laughs> to pry the secret out of Samson. What was this secret weapon that he used? She nagged her. <laughs> Nagging is that powerful weapon of women against men. If you want to pry something out, nag. As she was nagging, Samson was vexed to death by her constant nagging. She gave in to her. She is so much in love with Delilah to have told her the secret of his great strength. If we love others more than God, and in the case of Samson loving Delilah more than God, it will lead to problems and troubles in our life. We have to be careful with this and remember to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, for this is the greatest commandment. Failure to do so would lead us into troubles in life such as Samson. Samson's hair was cut. His Nazarite vow violated. His supernatural strength left him. He was now just an ordinary man with ordinary strength. And he was quickly captured by the Philistines. They gouged his eyes, imprisoned him in Gaza, and he was made forced into hard labor. Because of his weakness for Philistine women, Samson this time finally met his demise. God did not rescue him this time. He suffered the consequences of his sinfulness. From the strongest person in the world, the leader of Israel for 20 solid years, feared by his enemies, he has instantly denigrated into a weak, powerless, undignified prisoner of their sworn enemies. And this reminds us just how one sin, just one sin, can sabotage everything that we have worked hard for. God's name was mocked as a result. The Philistine regarded their victory over Samson as their God Dagon being more powerful than Yahweh, Israel's God. In Judges 16, 23 to 24, now the Lord of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice and said, Our God has given Samson, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. So you see, the name of the Lord has been dishonored by the Philistines because of what Samson did, because he committed this grievous sin. This is a reminder, it's a warning to us. When we sin, we as Christians who bear the name of the Lord would also bring dishonor to the name of our God. Let us be careful. Samson was placed in a hopeless situation. His eyes were gouged. He could not see anymore. He cannot be the leader of Israel anymore. His supernatural strength left him. He has been relegated to just a normal man with ordinary strength. He was chained. He was imprisoned. No escape for him. He is destined to be a slave for the remainder of his life. And he was forced into hard labor, grinding the mill of the Philistines. He is suffering from disgrace and humiliation of the extreme kind. And worse, the Philistine did not was not merciful enough to kill him. They wanted him alive so that he could be humiliated forever until for the rest of his life. Samson was made a spectacle to be mocked, to be shamed during the celebratory feast of the Philistines. And they attributed their victory over Samson to their god Dagon, defaming the name of the Lord God. All seems lost for Samson. He was powerless to do anything. His enemies gloated over him and over God. In this hopeless situation, Samson, with no one else to rely on, not even himself, turned to the only one who could help him. He cried out to the Lord and sought the help of God. His prayer was for God to remember him. He was repentant. He thought that God has forgotten him 
because his supernatural strength has departed from him. And hence, God himself departed from him as well. He was languishing in the prison in Gaza, doing hard labor, and no one cared for him. He was powerless. He was weak. He was useless. And he thinks that God has forsaken him and forgotten him. What did his prayer is? Let me go to the next slide. He says, God, remember me. This is a natural reaction of someone who suffered the consequences of disobedience and sin, to feel abandoned and secluded from God, that somehow God has forgotten us because of our sin. But God has not really forgotten Samson. God's sovereign plan was to redeem Samson and use him one last time to destroy the Philistines along with their leadership in tow. So we must always remember that God still knows and remembers you in whatever hopeless situation you may find yourself in. Called out to God like Samson. Then Samson asked for strength. He planned to bring down the whole structure they were in and kill everyone, including himself. He was willing to sacrifice himself to avenge the Philistines for what they did to him. He wanted to avenge the Philistines for the removal of his eyes. Now, this is an ancient practice wherein conquered kings and their leaders would have their eyes gouged out as a symbol of triumph by the captors and as a means of incapacitating the enemy from retaliation. It was also the means to humiliate the vanquished and to subjugate them. That's why they removed the eyes. Without the eyes, it would be difficult to do anything. So he would not be the leader anymore. His responsibility and calling by God for him to be Israel's leader has already ended by the removal of his eyes. The taking away of his eyes by his enemies of his God-given responsibility role as Israel's leader and God's plan for Samson was destroyed. And so in this prayer, we can see Samson's repentance from his sin. We can see his eagerness to destroy the Philistines as they mocked and scorned God. We can see his willingness to sacrifice himself to achieve this purpose and for God's name to be glorified over their God, Dagon. And God answered Samson's prayer gave him renewed strength one last time and with this recovered strength samson then pushed down the foundational pillars of the structure they were in resulting to the collapse of that entire structure and killing many in the process how many were killed more than three thousand the bible says there were three thousand men on the roof much much many more on the first floor and so all of them perish most of them probably perish samson perished along with them and we were not told how many died but the number that was killed there was more than the total number of people he has killed during his entire lifetime. That is a commentary of the, made by the writer. Samson was in a hopeless situation, as we have seen. Yet, in this situation, God still worked. God asserted and showcased his power. Now, the granting of the renewed strength of Samson was God's way of communicating to everyone. There is none more powerful than God, not Dagon. Not anyone for that matter. God is not to be mocked by mere puny humans with their worthless idols. God is zealous for his name and for his glory. He will not let his name be shamed. In 1 Samuel 12, 20-22, Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. Even if you have done evil, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. For... For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. The Lord is zealous for his own glory. For his name's sake, God will not forsake his people. He did not forsake Samson, neither will he forsake you. Whatever hopeless situation you may be in. When all seems hopeless and lost, we are powerless against people and situations. It may be situations that we ourselves have brought ourselves into because of our sin and disobedience, or it may just be situations that just happen to us. People who oppress us, sickness and diseases that has reached its terminal st uh, stage, 
and medicine has no cure for it, or relationship that has been damaged and severed by, uh, and there's no hope for reconciliation, whatever hopeless situation you find yourself in, let us remember there is a God who is more powerful than the seemingly hopeless situations in our lives. And God will not forsake his people. God will not forsake his elect. He loves you. He will surely help you as you cry out to God for help in repentance. God is not limited by our weakness, nor by our failures, nor by our sins. He's not limited by our limitations. He can work past this just as he did in Samson's life. So let us not lose hope. Let us pray, repent of our sins, and let us continue to put our faith, our trust in God. He may, he may not remove our problems or our difficulties, but we are assured that He will be there. In fact, He is there with you right now in whatever hopeless situation you are in. And in due time, I am sure, according to God's timetable, out of His perfect will, out of His purpose and plans for us, He will lift us up from this hopeless situation. In summary, let me just summarize. It's 12 o'clock, what we have learned today. God appointed Samson to be Israel's deliverer okay, from the hands of the Philistines. However, Samson dishonored God throughout his life. He put himself in various difficult situations that threatened his life and that threatened his mission. He failed many times in his responsibility as a covenant head. But God's mercies were at work in his life as God fulfilled his divine will through him. And we learned these three things, that God works through any mess up situation we are in to achieve his purposes, that God will work through our weaknesses to accomplish his plans, and that God will work through whatever hopeless condition that we are in so that he will assert and display his power. Samson's life serves as that example. God can and still work through us despite our sinful despite our difficult situations or hopeless situations that we are in. We need to repent, pray, and seek God's help. Remember, God has a wonderful plan for His people. One last word. In the light of God's redemptive plan of salvation, Samson's life example showed us the need for a perfect Savior. Samson's role to be Israel's Savior against the oppression of the Philistine. However, due to his weakness and his sinfulness, he failed to sustain this call, and he died a tragic death. Many centuries later, God would send His one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to be the deliverer for His people from the oppression of the dark effects of sin. But unlike Samson, Jesus lived a perfect life. He did not create any messed up situation while here on earth. He did not succumb to sin during His entire life here on earth, but He overcame temptation on all occasions. He was finally placed in a hopeless situation when He was nailed to the cross, but he overcame death through the resurrection power that God exerted. Samson's life pointed us to the need for a perfect and a better Savior, and this was revealed in the perfect Jesus Christ. You've watched The Covenant Word of God, the preaching telecast of Bread from Heaven Christian Fellowship's Media Outreach Program. We are blessed that the church continues to be a testimony of God's faithfulness. In His right time, may God lead us to begin construction of the new church sanctuary. You may visit our church website to see the details on the planned construction. And if the Lord is leading you to give, kindly deposit to RCBC as the primary account for the church building fund. Join us in earnest prayer so that through this project, we can continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to our communities and be a channel of blessing to those around us. Thank you for tuning in. See you again next week.